uh, took him out into the country and pistol whipped the hell out of him. You know, really? really put him in the hospital that time. But at any rate, didn't have to pay the five hundred dollars to the trapper. See, the way they do it was take the boy over to the Grand Park Station, whomever they caught, and uh, scare the hell out of him. And then uh, when he said, can't we arrange something about this, why then they would uh, reluctantly agree to a payment of uh, $500, and I'll meet you on the corner of Randolph and Bates. Uh, under the clock at Marshall Field at such and such an hour, and you have the money. This is the way they arranged it. Of course, the sergeant, the booking sergeant, was in on it. And he got his split from the. Well, sometimes they were. Uh, I heard from this mafia student of mine that uh, they would. Uh, uh, a good entrapper, a handsome young entrapper in the public library would make as much as a thousand dollars a week. Wow. In those years, that was a big money, too. Yeah. Did you hear any rumors regarding, let's say, well placed people in Chicago politics who were, who were gay at the time period in the 40s? Certainly. Lots of rumors. I don't know of any specific names that come to mind now, but... Uh, Did you hear Mayor Kennelly with the rumors about him? Oh, yes. Yes, there were rumors about Mayor Kennelly. He uh, was supposed to be a club member. Did you ever meet him at a gay function? No. As a matter of fact, though, when I was teaching, when I moved to teach at DePaul, uh, no, he never went out. He lived with his maiden sister in the Edgewater Beach Apartments mm -hmm. at Bryn Mawr. Right. And I lived just around the corner on Kenmore. And um, his honor uh, never was, he was extremely discreet. If he moved, it was in a higher circle, mm -hmm. uh, one that uh, took in the Gold Coast, but you never saw him anywhere. No way. He had too much to lose. Hearing church officials who were also uh, in Chicago. Yes. That was um, not Cardinal Mundelein. Gritch? Gritch, I think it was, yeah. Yes. Had a roving eye, but no one ever proved it the way they did about Cardinal Spellman mm -hmm. in New York. Because he was the, the queen, I guess, of. You've heard that. I've heard, I, that. I've heard you know, the uh, exploit. Around 1950, was, did, there seemed to be a greater crackdown at that point in time. Was there like a, a massive <laughs> period of rage? And oh, and there were so many crackdown periods. I don't know whether I could actually place one in 1950 or not, mm -hmm. or in those years. But there was always an up and down, a, a regular wave-like pattern of freedom for homosexuals and then a period of crackdown. Mm. And you can be as sure that one would follow the other as day would night. There was, um, um, it wasn't an easy life. But as things opened up and became easier, I will say that the crackdowns began to be spaced farther and farther apart. Mm -hmm. What time would you say that? Well, that, of course, was toward the end of the 50s. Um, I really wasn't paying much attention to it because I was going on my merry way in the tattoo shop by then. That's right. And I wasn't out cruising or drinking or anything else. You know, as I have one line in the autobiography saying, you didn't have to because all the beauties came to you. Yeah. Um. You mentioned in your autobiography that in the mid fifties the leather you know, scene took off in Chicago. Mm, about nineteen fifty six. What was the occasion for this? What I mean, no why, why do you date it from fifty six? 
um, because Kinsey began to be interested in it around 1954. And um, let's see, he photographed me with Mike Mixie in 1949. That was mentioned in the autobiography, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, he knew nothing about it in 49. Uh, but Mike Mixie did a lot of illustration for uh, a lot of uh, drawings, homosexual drawings of tattooed men getting uh, various punishments. And then uh, <coughs> Marlon Brando's movie, I think that, as much as anything else, began... Which movie was that? The Wild One. The Wild One. Began to um, coalesce the thing, began to make it known to people who didn't know why they were harboring such emotions. Uh, but all of a sudden, uh, after The Wild One, which I think was dated 1955, uh, things began to draw together. And in New York, uh, <coughs> a couple of bars began to appear, and leather uh, began to make itself shown. I bought my first leather jacket from Sears Roebuck in 1949. Yeah, and I still have it hanging <laughs> in there, cracked and dusty by now. But uh, it, uh, uh, I was early on that, very early <laughs> on that. I just happened to like leather. Of course, I found out why I like leather from Havelock Ellis. Where did you make contact with other people who been through the leather scene at this time? Was there any place that people would be getting? That, no there way. Was there even a circle of people that no. you knew? No. It, if you could tease uh, sadistic tendencies out of a sexual partner uh, by saying certain things, uh, fine. Uh, but you had to do the work. There was no codification at all. No ritual, no gathering, no nothing. Everything was individualized. And then, uh, I've forgotten the name of that first bar. Was it the Copper Cup? in New York, mm -hmm. uh, whatever, it began. Nothing began in Chicago until many years later. The Gold Coast was the first leather bar in Chicago. Did you know Chuck Renfro? Did you come in uh, contact with him? Did I? And Dom or Judas, who did the yeah. drawing in the old Gold Coast. The old uh, Chris Studio crowd. I wrote about them. Uh, in uh, a Phil Andros novel. Oh, you did? What at, time? Uh, let's see. Uh, my Brother the Hustler. My Brother the Hustler. That's yeah. Uh -huh. Phil was going all over the country. But he worked for Chuck Renzo in two chapters. And uh, uh, Chuck did him out of money. Chuck was a great... Uh, con man, great crook, and still is one of the greatest cooks in Chicago. But after that um, little episode, which I pilloried Mr. Renslow and Mr. Orhudos, um, I set up a vendetta that hasn't come to an end today yet. This was in 1970, I think, Mr. San Francisco Esser. Or, uh, I mean, uh, my brother, the husband, was probably. What specifically did he do to you at that particular period of time? What did they do to me? Yes. Uh, nothing really, very much, except they sucked me dry of every uh, idea that I had and made use of it and made money on it. And uh, <coughs> when I moved out to to California in 1965, I was just fed up with it, 
you know. And so I got my, even that way. And Dom or Judas got even by putting Sam Stewart into a, one of his uh, 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 book of drawings called Locker Room. We haven't exchanged a word or a letter since. Do Renslow and his group basically have a monopoly on the leather scene at that yes, period of time? Yes, complete monopoly. There was no other leather bar in Chicago for many years until uh, after the Gold Coast uh, was started. When was the Gold Coast started? About 1958 or 9? Something around there. And, uh, well, now this material about Renzo and Orohudos, I hope you'll treat in great confidence and don't want to reawaken any kind of demons. This, this, let me. Yes, I'd like to have a warning note that there's no scholar ought to make use of any of this material about Renzo or Orohudos until the year 2000. Please. All right. That'll do that. Um, anything else that you would like to talk about the 50s uh, that you can remember about from Chicago? <coughs> stick vividly, vividly in your mind. Now, at that time, you started your tattoo shop, correct? Yeah. Well, you see, um, for one reason, it doesn't stick in my mind so vividly was that I was keeping a um, an elaborate, lengthy journal for Kinsey, mm -hmm. and uh, who was interested in the sexual motivations of tattooing. But the journal itself, which expanded into a million and a half or two million words over a period of eight years, uh, became actually a uh, sexual journal too for me. And. Um, uh, for a lot of the Chicago homosexual scene. And the yeah. yeah, the journals in the Kinsey archives, all eight volumes of it, I think, or however many there were when it was. I, I kept it up for two years after Kinsey died. I stopped it about 1958. Uh, so it ran. Uh, for six years, I guess. Um, from what? From 1952 to 1958. What kind of uh, things did you put into the journal? Everything that happened in the tattoo shop and everything that happened to me sexually. So it's uh, kind of a, an extended autobiography or a study of tattooing. Mm -hmm. I found 32 motivations for tattooing. You mentioned that yeah. in your, your autobiography. And Kinsey isolated 25 of them as sexual in one way or another. Sounds like you and Kinsey had a fairly good relationship. Oh, we did. I still have about 100 letters from him that he wrote from time to time. Um, every time he came to Chicago, we'd see each other. Did you put him in contact with other uh, oh, yes. specials to do uh, yeah. interviews? Yes. Uh, I helped a good deal with that. Pointed out some of my literary acquaintances in New York and elsewhere in Europe. Uh, and he uh, communicated with a great many of them. Julian Green and Andre Gide on up and down uh, in the literary field. And the interview he did with you was a very lengthy one, correct? Five hours. Whereas he never spent more than one hour with most people. But I think the thing that fascinated him was my stud file. Yeah. Um, I had a record on three by five cards right from the very first, the very first sexual contact I had at 17. What would 
what would you put down on the card? Um, the name, the time, the date, I mean, what happened, uh, and maybe some note about friend of so-and-so or something like that. They were all uh, coded. I can show you one of them if you'd like to yeah, see. Yes, but I that's for sure. Yeah, well, it's a simple substitution code. You could, could, you could break it in uh, 10 minutes uh, as a cryptographer with the proper... Uh, Is there a reason why you use a code? Why I use the code? Yeah. No, except just to keep it from out of... Here's the name, here's uh, Chicago, here's where it happened, here's the date, uh -huh. uh, here's the size. No, here's the size. Here's what happened. Here's the number of contacts. Uh, so uh, these are the number of times that it uh, occurred. And uh, this happens to be that he was, uh, as I remember, I, I can't read this without <laughs> decoding it myself. I, I haven't got all those things in my head. But uh, this was... Uh, a uh, young man who worked in a flower shop in Chicago and who had been introduced to me by uh, uh, somebody. I would have to right. decipher that, <laughs> give you an answer. So Kinsey was very fascinated about it. Yeah, because of course he was having, this, he did the same sort of thing with his interviews, you know, except his was much infinitely more elaborate and it was a placement code a little square on it would have a dot in one corner which would mean one thing in the other corner it would mean something else in the lower corner it's still something else and uh, it was an extremely elaborate unbreakable uh, cipher code actually which only two or three people knew and uh, Mackenzie are you still in communication with Kinsey? Too, oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Kinsey died just uh, a couple weeks ago. Oh, she did. She was 83. She lived uh, some 26 years beyond her husband, who died in 1956. In the 50s, when you were in Chicago, did you come across anybody who had been uh, starting to get involved with homosexual rights organizations, the homophile movements, such as Mattachine or one or anything like that. Did you know anybody? No. One came in a plain brown envelope, and believe you me, it was hidden from everybody. I subscribed to it during the 50s, and uh, it, uh, well, I started in 1952 while I was still teaching. I wouldn't dare have dared let uh, anybody see that magazine arriving. How did you find out about it, Sue? Through Kinsey? Through Kinsey, yeah. And, uh, or no, I guess uh, someone in Chicago just told me, one of my friends, uh -huh. homosexual friends, told me about one. You know, Kinsey introduced me to Der Kreis in Zurich, mm -hmm. and that was all. You didn't hear from any of your friends the formation of a, like a Mattachine chapter in Chicago in, in the 50s or early 60s? No. Did they start that early? There were about three of them that formed and failed, but mm -hmm. at one time, yeah. you know Ira Jones? No. Okay. He's with the Rainbow Organization now, but he was in one of the first uh, Madison chapters, which formed about 1954, but didn't last very long. Do you have any contact with the Rainbow Organization? Uh, only through that now he, you know, uh, does run. Uh, statement that you're too fucking old to write. Was it Renable who, who said that? That she was the boy, yeah. <laughs> so you see, in writing the two chapters, <laughs> I was getting even with that statement. Oh, I see. Um, so when did you start writing? Actually, I didn't start writing until I met Rudolf Jung, who was the English editor of Der Kreis. He came to Chicago in... Uh, 1958, 
because he wanted to meet the people of the Chris studio, Renzo and the others, who had been sending him uh, 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 photographs in posing staff. Of course, that was all that was allowed then, you know, um, which he used, many of which he used in uh, the four-page insert of, uh, or four photographs, two-page insert on slick paper in every issue of Der Christ, uh, which of course gave the uh, customs uh, office fits, even though they were complete. They confiscated every fourth issue of Der Christ regularly on the grounds that it was obscene material. They wouldn't get away with it today, of no. course, but uh, they sure did then. And uh, <laughs> some of my stories in Der Christ never even reached me because uh, they were held up by custom. And I would have to go to Europe and pick them up uh, uh, when I visited Rudolph. But uh, what did you ask me to talk about when I started writing? Oh, oh well, Rudolph, Rudolph taught me into writing a couple of essays uh, for Dirk Christ, and then he expanded his prodding to take in stories, and I wrote a great many stories for uh, Dirk Christ, and then he introduced me to um, Kim Kent in Copenhagen. And I created the character of Phil Andros then, and so that was that. I've been writing desultorily for, since about 1959, I suppose. I had had a, a novel published in 1936, as I told you, a yes. book of short stories, a little earlier than that, 1930, when I was still in college. Uh, but that was subsidized, that book of short story, called Pan and the Firebird. Uh, <laughs> but, Are you writing uh, something right now? Yeah, I'm uh, doing several things <laughs> right now. I'm revising an old novel about Gertrude and Alice uh, and Sir Francis Rose, whom I have rechristened uh, Sir Arthur Lilly. Uh, I started to write that thing in 1950, and it certainly sounded like it. Um, so I'm revising it. Maybe it'll be publishable. I don't know. I hope so. Bill Andrews is having a book of short stories coming out this summer. Yes, um, that's what I heard. Collection of things. Are they new ones? Are they reissuing? Well, they're stories that aren't. I haven't really reached the wide audience. Some of them are from Der Kreis, uh -huh. uh, slightly revised and updated, and uh, some are from Eos and Amigo in Copenhagen, and uh, uh, there's a couple out of Stud. Stud's being republished partially by Allison Press uh -huh. in uh, November. Yes, that's what I heard. And, uh, Incidentally, that picture is Thomas Finland drawing for the cover of uh, this new book in this summer. Oh. That's Phil up there. I have a photograph of it that Tom sent me. Oh, that's one of Dom, Dom's paintings. That is strange. It's uh, Orpheus and Eurydice. Ah, oh, I see. He's turning to put her out of existence deliberately you can tell from the enigmatic expression on his face. Uh -huh. <laughs> However, Dom Artutus, he was supposed, this character, Orpheus, was supposed to be carrying a lyre in his hand, and I'll tell you, kid, that looks like a zither to me. That's no lyre. I don't think Dom knew what a lyre looked like in those days. Uh, the plan for more reissuing of your Phil and his stories? Uh, I don't think uh, so. There's, uh, oh, uh, 
Don Allen of Gray Fox Press has got together another collection, not uh, just of Phil Andrews, but of other pen names, and wants to bring that out uh, in the early part of next year, I guess. So, I, <laughs> all of this has been so damned amazing for me, because uh, when I wrote the Phil Andrews stories, there was absolutely no feedback of any kind from anybody. I never heard anything. And about the novels, of course, if the publishers of those ever got any communications from uh, readers, they just threw them in the wastebasket. I never heard a word. And then all of a sudden I find that Phil Andrews and the novels that he wrote 15 years ago had a great effect on people like Edmund White, Felice Picano, John Preston, uh, George Whitmore, all these kids who are writing nowadays and are in their 30s and early 40s grew up with Phil Andros yeah. and Lord, the notoriety, which is or the notice, let's say, which is suddenly descending on me, is totally <laughs> unexpected. I won't say that I don't enjoy it, enjoy it partially. Uh, John Preston had a big article in the July issue of Stallion. Have you ever seen that magazine? I don't I don't think, well, it's uh, uh, a new magazine. Uh. Yes, yeah, so I've just seen it on the newsstand. Oh, yes. Is there you are. Yeah. Al, now? Yes. Uh, this was sent to me from New York. It hasn't reached the West Coast, I don't think, yet. I think but I saw it in Chicago. In Chicago. Uh, he's got uh, the moon glow picture of me sandwiched amongst all these naked beauties here. Uh, this moon glow picture. Oh, wow, that is a nice one. Uh, when was that taken? In 1950 in Paris. Oh, yeah, that is nice. But here, as Sam Stewart, a college professor who edited the World Book and wrote Dear Sammy, as Phil Sparrow became Chicago's legendary tattoo artist as Phil Andros, and so on. Yeah, I've got to pick that up. <laughs> but uh, he goes on at uh, great rate. Oh, mercy. <laughs> Uh, and uh, treated me very kindly in the article. I didn't uh, Great. know that he was I will have to pick that going up to do it at all. Uh -huh. Great. Well, what made you leave Chicago? Maybe this is like the final question I'll ask on the, inter the tape interview, but what was the uh, motivation to um, move out to California? Well, most people I knew my good friends, the Wilcoxes, had moved earlier to Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Uh, tattooing was closed down in Illinois because they changed the law to uh, uh, be t you had to be 21 instead of 18. That cut all the boot sailors out automatically. Uh, although at the same time, and this is curious, the Illinois law permitting homosexual contact was changed down to 18, but you could have a homosexual contact, but you couldn't be tattooed till you were 21. Yes. That made the tattoo artists furious in Chicago. Uh, it didn't particularly affect me because I was getting tired of tattooing by then anyway, but I uh, then went with Cliff Raven, one of my students, up to Milwaukee for a year of weekends tattoo just on the weekends, and that's when I wrote many of the Phil Andrews stories instead, uh, or began to write them on the old electric up to Milwaukee. Um, uh, but as I say, my friends either died or moved away in Chicago. Uh, they changed the law. There wasn't really anything keeping me there. Emmy died. The Wilcoxes were gone. Uh, I didn't particularly care for the 
for the Renslow crowd, which I hadn't alienated yet. And uh, so I thought I'll open a shop in California. I intended to open in San Francisco, but Lyle Tuttle, who had a monopoly on tattooing, uh, pulled a fast one on me. He bribed one of the public health ladies in the office to type up a phony ordinance saying that uh, 21 was the lowest legal age in California. In, I mean in San Francisco. It wasn't. It was 18. But that way he chased me over to Oakland. And, uh, well, it's a dirty business to have to do <laughs> Sounds like it is. It's a dog eat dog, I'll tell you. When did you um, quit doing tattooing? How 1970, March. I'd been strong armed by our black brothers uh, three times in the shop, and I decided that the fourth time would be a bullet or a knife. That was enough. Uh -huh. So I killed off Phil Farrell. <laughs> <laughs> You know, the title comes from uh, John Skelton's poem, The Lament of Jane Scroop for her pet, Philip Sparrow, who used to eat crumbs from between her cleavies in the <laughs> 15th century. I, I remember you mentioning it in the book, yeah. but you didn't give it explicit uh, details for exactly where it came from in that poem. Yeah. Well, I guess we'll conclude the recording. Uh, portion of this. Is there anything else that you would like to... Uh, I can't think of anything okay. relating to Chicago right at the moment. You have certainly prepared yourself well and uh, asked a lot of intelligent questions, <laughs> some of which I couldn't really answer. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Okay. Well, thank you again very much. I really appreciate your... Oh, it's been a pleasure. Really.